For most people, war is like a bad marriage. An unending affair of strife, bitterness, and glimmering moments of joy that serve only to prolong the suffering. But for Pyrrhus, fighting came as naturally as breathing. Following a war between Demetrius and the king of Egypt, Pyrrhus was sent to the desert kingdom as a hostage. Here, his luck finally returned. His many war stories made an impression on the Egyptian king, as did his ability to laugh off any insult thrown at him. With such a capable friend in his court, the king sensed an opportunity. He equipped Pyrrhus with a small army and the ships needed to transport it to Epirus, hoping to forge in him an ally on the Greek mainland. The prospect of retaking Epirus thrilled Pyrrhus, as did the chance to exploit the chaos in nearby Macedon to seize both realms for himself. At long last, the exiled king was returning home. Ptolemus has set his guards on high alert. Let us seek out the weakest point in his defense and launch our attack there. Epirus will be ours again before Neoptolemus goes to the city. This bloodshed must come to an end, lest Epirus be reduced to rubble. I am willing to share the throne with you, Pyrrhus, for the good of our people. We have retaken my old kingdom, but this is only the beginning. The time has come to expand our domain into Macedon. Dark tidings, your highness. It appears that your old friend Demetrius plans to take Macedon for himself. His armies will soon arrive from the east.
My lord, Macedon is divided among several factions. We could take advantage of these divisions and take them out one by one. Or we could ally with one of them against the other two. Oh, 
Sana. Alamas Bombus y Portare. Cada y Rocket Abadakas. Rocks on evil Tare. Your help is welcome, Pyrrhus. Let us seal this alliance with the blood of our enemies. Very well. If you are building an alliance to seize Macedon, I will simply have to do the same. Oh, my God. 
Victory will soon be ours. On this, on this. Not by Neoptolemus to poison you. Apparently, he plans to take Epirus for himself. Oh, if information like this can leak so easily from his camp, then surely he will inspire his loyalty. Let us strike him first and give the people of Epirus a proper ruler to look up to. I promise. I will arrest this. Your prowess in battle is impressive. That much I will give you, Epirus. But this is not the end. The throne of Macedon will yet be mine. Hello, eh? What are your soldiers doing standing around in my camp? I am shocked. No matter, you will regret the day that you return. with that honorless cur long ago! Oh, 
had the struggle for Macedon been a play, it would have been booed out of the theater for its confusing, overlapping plotlines. Stories, after all, should be simple, straightforward, and with an entertaining hero to cheer for. All of the things that the real politics lack. At the end of the war, Pyrrhus came to blows with his old master Demetrius. Each led their forces against the other, and, in what must have been an act of divine mischief, the two armies marched right past each other. As Demetrius raided across Epirus, a second army, commanded by his finest general, Pantacus, met Pyrrhus in battle. Pantacus challenged the Epirot king to a duel, and Pyrrhus accepted. With thousands of men watching and cheering for their leaders, the two commanders fought man against man. Swords clashed, shields buckled, and for a short while, the brutality of the war was distilled into the shapes of those men. Those two kingdoms personified. Pantaucus managed a single strike on Pyrrhus, but not long after, Pyrrhus wounded his opponent in the thigh and neck. Pantaucus was forced to retreat, and Pyrrhus claimed victory. His boldness earned him the nickname the Eagle. But his triumph proved hollow when the war ended in a stalemate. For all his efforts, Pyrrhus returned to Epirus empty-handed.